Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to our Wednesday night Bible class. Uh, and, and as Doug mentioned, uh, we're bringing in a new quarter uh, starting tonight. And uh, what we'll do is um, uh, Jesse Beeson was uh, scheduled to, to uh, kick this off, so uh, I'll take the burden of uh, introducing you to what we're going to be talking about for this entire quarter before I get into my lesson. Uh, Jesse is uh, recuperating at the Christian Care Center. I've uh, visited him a couple of times, and uh, we do plan to have Jesse uh, come and speak to us about Eve. Uh, uh, he's uh, pretty adamant about doing that subject. Uh, on next week, uh, Brother Bill Sisk uh, will uh, teach our lesson, and Bill will talk about Elizabeth and Mary. And what we're going to do is we're going to just move men up uh, until Jesse has the strength um, to come in and uh, teach. He was uh, pretty adamant to me in the hospital that he wanted to, he wanted to talk about Eve, uh, the mother of all things. He, he, he wanted some things that he wanted to share. And so we, we pray for Jesse's uh, recovery so that you know, we will all have that, that opportunity. So let's go to our Father in prayer and we'll, we'll get started. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We ask, Father, that you be with each and every one of us as we study your divine word. Uh, be with our beloved brother Jesse as he recuperates from his health issues. We ask that you strengthen him, we strengthen, that you strengthen and guide his caregivers, and that you bring him back to us at the next appointed time. Father, be with all of us who have uh, illnesses and afflictions. Um, we pray for uh, their health. There are many in our congregation, Father, that are suffering with various ailments. And tonight, Father, we ask that you just clear our minds of all these things, that we may study your word, that we may study your word in love, and that we may learn uh, many of the truths and the precious uh, pearls of your gospel. This is our prayer to fathers in Christ's name. Amen. Tonight we're going to be studying about a lady uh, named Hannah, um, and a mother of great faith. Hannah is a great story. Um, it's a story of, a, of a great faith. A, a lot of people like to say that it's a, it's, it's a good uh, Bible study for ladies. And uh, I'd like to say I think it's a good Bible study for anybody uh, uh, who studies uh, the life of this remarkable woman. There's a lot of things that are, that are going to come out in the text about, you know, what she did. You know, uh, the name Hannah means grace or favor. That's how it's usually translated in the Hebrew. It can also be translated uh, beautiful or passion. Uh, it's translated favor here because, and grace, because that's what she did. And we're going we're gonna to see that come out in the scriptures, not just the beauty of her name, but, but what she did and how she handled uh, her situation uh, that she found herself in. As we go through the quarter, various men will be talking about uh, uh, various uh, uh, men and women in the Bible, and you're going to see uh, connections uh, with their name. And, and, and the one thing about this story is, you know, she earned up, she lived up to uh, the meaning of her name. Uh, we see a, a, another lady named Jezebel that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, that name means uh, purity or chase in the Hebrew. Um, you see a lot of Hannah's, but you don't see a lot of Jezebel's running around today. Uh, it's not a good name because Jezebel didn't live up to her name. So uh, we all understand, and we all, even in today's world, uh, you know, we understand the value of a good name. But most importantly, as people of faith, we really understand the value of living up to your name, living up to the name that God has given to each and every one of us as Christians. And uh, a good example of that is the life of this, uh, of this lady, Hannah. 
Uh, we find the story of Hannah in the books of First uh, and Second Samuel. Um, basically, the the, uh, the first chapter of the book of Samuel and the and and Hannah's prayer uh, in the second chapter of Samuel in the first ten verses. Uh, the timing here, uh, the book of Samuel was written uh, after the period uh, of the judges. In the old, original Jewish Old Testament, the book of Samuel appears after the book of Judges. And, and Hannah was uh, Samuel's mother, and we know that Samuel was the last judge of Israel. And he was also, you know, the first prophet, uh, so to speak. So this book took place right as the, uh, at, at the end of the judges, the period of the judges, and talks about the period when Israel uh, wanted a, a king like the other nations. We find that in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8. And, uh, and both these books go on to talk about the first king of Israel, Saul, and a successor, uh, King David. Uh, the book, 1 Samuel, covers about a period of 100 years as, as, you, as you read through the text. It's about 100 years. And 2 Samuel covers another probably 60 years. Uh, these books from uh, 1100 B.C. to about 1000 B.C. Uh, we don't know the author specifically of the book of, uh, uh, of Samuel. We, we do know that it was originally one book. When the Greek Old Testament was, uh, the Septuagint, was uh, published in about 3 B.C., uh, the translators uh, separated the book of Samuel, the book of Chronicles, and the book of Kings into two. And so right around 3 B.C., it became 1st and 2nd uh, Samuel. So it, and, the, and then the main idea of the book of Samuel is the, is the transition. It, it covers a transition of the nation of Israel from the period of the judges to uh, the period of the kings. Um, the name Samuel means uh, God has heard. Or, uh, and, and we're going to see as we go through the text, we're going to see that actual come alive here as we talk about um, um, the events of this amazing, of this amazing book. So with that background, we're going to just do a survey of, uh, of the first uh, chapter and the first part of the uh, second chapter of Samuel. And we'll just sort of uh, go through and uh, I'll point out some things uh, that are important um, uh, about, our, about our subject, which is uh, Hannah. Now, there was a certain man of Rothmathian Zopium, Zopium, the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was, and I got two pronunciations, Elkanah and Elkanah. Um, I always struggle with these pronunciations, and a lot of times you'll get two different things depending on the author of the commentary. And his name was Elkanah, the son of uh, uh, Jeroam, the son of Ethu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zephu, and it says he's an Ephraimite. Now, uh, they're saying that because that's where he currently lives, but uh, the First Chronicles chapter 6, verse 34, tells us that he was a Levite. So he, he was uh, of, the, of the Levite clan. Um, it, it's, it's not here, but if you go up uh, into First Chronicles, it will tell you this man was really a Levite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. So right away, the author establishes the background. Uh, this man, uh, Elkanah, was an important man, obviously, 
One, because the Bible uh, gives you his background. And, we, uh, and again, we see him also in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 6. And we also know that he was a man of substance because he had two wives. Uh, now, we know uh, in the Bible that we, we see that particularly in, in, in many of our Old Testament figures, uh, you know, men had multiple wives, but, you know, it's, it's good to bring out that that was not God's intent from the beginning. Uh, when God invented marriage from the, from the very creation of man and woman. Uh, you know, it, a man is to leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh, Genesis 2 and verse 24. So you know, we understand that. But here, and, and, and a lot of times in this culture, if a man had a wife that was barren, Hannah mentioned first, probably his first wife, because she's mentioned first, when, when she was barren, men w would take other wives. It, it, it was an, a, a, a gregarian, uh, an agrarian society. Uh, children were very, very important uh, to families, particularly male children were important because male children had the, they had the birthright and they, had, they, they usually carried on the, the trade of their, of their Jewish father. So, it was very, very important. We even see that in Jesus being a carpenter, you know, because his father was a carpenter. So we even see by Jesus' time, those traditions were still uh, pretty much in place in terms of the culture. So he had two wives. And, and if you look at the book of Solomon, um, you have two women you, you, or more, you've got problems. And so we've got a problem here. I mean, it just, you know, it's just designed for a man to be with one woman. And when you get away from that design, whether it's practical or not in whatever culture, it's going to be issues. And there were issues here. And the issue was Hannah was barren. She could not at that moment bear children, which in that culture and at that time, uh, it was really considered almost a curse. Uh, so this is a serious issue. I mean, uh, in today's, you know, go get them culture, we run and we just do this and we do it with kids, we do it without kids. We don't even value our children like the way, you know, the, the gift that God gives us with our children. We don't even value our children as we, so, as we should sometimes as a society. But in this society, a, a barren woman was... This, this was a serious problem. This was a, a heartfelt issue uh, that caused Hannah a lot of grief, a lot of problems, as it would uh, any woman uh, of, of that time and of that period. This was a religious man. Uh, they went up to the city, I'm in verse 3, yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phanias, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions of Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And so when we're talking about portions, we're probably talking about uh, the meat and the flour offerings uh, that were made. If you look uh, uh, at some of these festivals that were done, uh, uh, Book, of Num uh, Book of Numbers, Book of Exodus, Deuteronomy, they talk about the feast that, that, that were important uh, uh, in the Jewish religion at that time, and they would make that, that pilgrimage. Now, him being a rich man, he could probably keep them relatively separate. Uh, but every year, they had to all come together and go to this religious feast. And, you know, the, 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 you know Deuteronomy, it tells you, you know, you know, when you go to these feasts to, to give your peace offerings to God and to worship God, one of the requirements was you had to be happy about it. You had to... You have to have a good continence about it. You have to be happy about it. But there were issues with her being happy about it because not only did she have to go with this other woman, 
that was her husband's other wife, but this other woman was torturing her because she didn't have children. Now, her husband compensated for it by giving her double portions, a, a double portion of the meat, double portion of the flour, to show uh, his love for her. You know, he obviously truly loved her, but it still couldn't quite fill the void that she was bearing. And it really made it a tough situation for her because now she's in a situation where she's got to, the, 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 the time of her, in the, of the year, where she had to go to worship her God and, and, and give her best to her God was probably the time that she dreaded the most because she was with her enemy. She had to be tied with her enemy. And there's a lesson there. Somewhere in there is a lesson for us about you know, how focused you know, we ought to be about worshiping our God and not allowing all of the, 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 the travails of life uh, get in our way and to always have a good uh, countenance, always to have, a, uh, uh, have thanksgiving in our heart to God. The fact that we're all here today, uh, you know, worshiping God, talking about God, being together with God, uh, you know, is a true blessing that we should always be thankful for. And we should have never allowed the enemies of that uh, get in our way. But she had a difficult task. And at verse 6, and her rival provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her room. So this other uh, woman is, is, is uh, Penina is, is really giving Hannah a difficult time and exposing the one thing in her life that's giving her the most grief. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, and therefore she wept and did not eat. So this was not only causing her, I mean, the one, this one time a year when they're going together to worship is the, is the time that she felt the worst. You know, and, and you know what? Things haven't changed today. You know, the, the devil still works that way. You know, he can still put things and he can still put obstacles in our way he can still make things awful for us, particularly when, you know, it's time for us to worship. So, you know, just like Hannah had to sidestep some things, she had to get past her rival in this case, sometimes we're called on to do the same thing. That's why this isn't just a good lesson for women. It's a good lesson for everybody. It's a good lesson for anyone who calls himself uh, a child of God. This caused her spiritual problems. Because again, her countenance has to be high. She had to eat and, and, and be festive, as the, as the Levitical law teaches us, uh, in how these festivals were carried out, how this worship was carried out yearly. You know, they had to eat. They had to be thankful. They had to be festive. They had to be happy. And she's so miserable, she's, she's not doing any of these things. She's not eating. She's not happy. So this is causing spiritual grief you know, as well as her own uh, mental and physical well-being. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So he's trying to convince her, look, be happy. You know, I, he, he's showing her how much that he really, really cares. He's been giving her double portions, and it's obvious that he had very, very strong love and affection for, for Hannah. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now this is about, from where they're living to Shiloh is, a, is about 20 miles. So, you know, in this primitive society, that's a, that's a pretty good haul, 20 miles. So just imagine being locked in a person with a person that you didn't like, a person that was torturing you, for 20 long miles with donkeys and camels and there and back. I mean, so this, she had to be completely miserable. When you, when, when you look at the, the situation, there was just nothing good about it. Now, Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was 
the bitterness of soul as she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. So she's, she's praying, she's worshiping, she's weeping. All of her feelings are coming out, all the issues that she's having. Then in verse 11, she made a vow. She says, oh, Lord of hosts, if you just look at my situation, look at your maidservant, just look at my situation and give your maidservant, give her the ultimate blessing, which in this case would be a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. So she's giving a vow that, look, you bless me with a male child, Lord, and I will give that child to you. I'll be so grateful. I'll be so happy. I'll give that child to you. I mean, that's a, a very, very tough vow for a barren woman to make, that when she has her child, that she would give him completely up to the Lord. But when you think about it, that's the same charge that we have today when the Lord blesses us with children. You know, blessed is the man whose quiver is full. But we have a responsibility as Christians to, to return our children to the Lord. So here she's making a vow because she doesn't have children. So, you know, we have to make that same commitment to turn our children back to the Lord, uh, just like Hannah. You know, nothing has really changed here. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. In this culture, back in the day, and we still see it, uh, like in the Middle Eastern countries and some of the the older, um, the older culture, the other countries uh, in, in Syria and some of these other countries that are in that area, that people generally pray out loud. And that was probably the case here, that people prayed out loud. Here, she's praying, but she's only moving her lips. So Eli the priest is just seeing her lips move, and he's not hearing her pray. He's looking, he's looking at her on the outside. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her heart was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So here's a priest, and he thinks she's drunk, which is really interesting. Here you have a woman who's barren, and lowly at, at a very very low point in her life and she's praying to God and then you have a priest who is probably at, at, at the highest of the of the social order with all kinds of community respect and all kinds of, uh, of, of, of prestige of being a priest and training uh, and here he only sees the outer Hannah that's all he sees. But the Lord, the Lord God, heard her heart. You see, you know, what God thinks of us and the life that we live uh, before God, the, the secret life that we live that before God that we can't, that we can't escape, uh, away from God about, that is the life that's the most important. That's the, that's the life that God cares about the most. It's not people and what people think that we should worry about. Because a lot of people are Eli's. They only see the outside. They don't see really what's in the heart. Another lesson that, that Hannah, that this uh, text is teaching us, and Hannah said, how long have you, and Eli said to her, how long have you been drunk? Put, put your wine away from you. And Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. And then Eli answered and said, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition." which you have asked him. So she explains to him, look, I'm a, I'm a good woman, and I'm praying to God. And that is how you solve your issues. That's, that's where you go. You, you know, Hannah went to where her help was. You know, 
she went, she went to the Lord. She went to God. You know, that's what we should do. There are times that people of prestige and power can't help us. There are going to be times when doctors don't have the answers or lawyers don't have the answer or any of these other people that we think can shepherd us through an easier or a better life. Sometimes your recourse is to be prostrate before the Lord and, and, and to pray and, and, and for the, the true and the living God to grant your petition. You know, Hannah, and, and Hannah was down to that. That's where she was at. And so she was meeting her Lord where she was at. She had a need. She prayed. And this is not an easy problem. This is, you know, this is a woman who's, who's barren. And then, in verse 19, they rose early in the morning, they worshiped before the Lord, returned and came home. Um, Elkanah knew Hannah's wife, and the Lord remembered her. Now, when you, you see that expression sometimes uh, in the Bible, the Lord remembered. It's not that the Lord ever forgot her, the Lord knew her the whole time. Uh, it basically means the... Uh, God answered her, or God answered her prayer, is, is, is what that expression, is what that expression means. And so in the process of time, you know, she became pregnant, she conceived, and she bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. Hence, this translation of the word Samuel means God has heard. So, she prayed to God, and God blessed her with her answer, and she conceived Samuel. And so we see already the importance of this text, because now we're seeing the birth of the last judge of Israel, uh, the first prophet, and the man who, was, who would uh, initially install uh, Saul and, and uh, David as the, as the first kings of the kingdom of Israel. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer the Lord the yearly sacrifice in his vow, but she didn't go. So uh, Elkanah is still making his um, a yearly travel uh, up to, uh, you know, but she stays behind because what she wants to do is, is she wants to, she wants to uh, fulfill her vow. And so what she does is she says, I will not go up until the child is weaned, and then I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. And so, uh, now in this culture, um, and in these days, uh, a woman uh, nursed a child for about three years. So this child is at least is going to be at least three years old when she takes him to Eli. But you could also read into this text uh, with that word "weaned" that that that, that, that is, is an idea of a uh, of a, a physical and a mental weaning, meaning the child might have been around eleven or twelve. But the, but the text clearly says, but the child was young. So uh, wh whether it, it means he was three or whether he was eight or nine or ten, the bottom line was he was young. He was a little boy when she's going to, um, when she's going to give him up. So the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls, an epoch of flour, that's about 24 or so pounds, and a skin of wine, that's how they carried uh, beverages in, in those days. And she brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, again, about 20 miles. And the child was young. And then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. So they're going through the course of their natural sacrifices. And she said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by here, you here, praying to the Lord. 
For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked him. Therefore, I have also lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. And so they worship the Lord there. So she fulfills her promise. She made a vow that if, uh, if God blessed her with a child, uh, she would give him to the service of the Lord forever. So when the child is old enough, she takes him to Shiloh and she turns the child over to the priest, Eli, who's probably an, an old man by now. And this child is going to be into the service of the Lord, uh, helping the priest. And so here we get into Hannah's prayer, uh, which we will find uh, in chapter 2, in the verse 10 verses. And some people call it Hannah's song or Hannah's psalm. And all three uh, characterizations are correct. Uh, because if you look at the, um, at the psalm, the way that it is written, it employs all the... Uh, the Hebrew parallelism that you see uh, in the Song of Songs or the Song or, 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 or Proverbs, um, you know, Hebrew uh, poems didn't necessarily rhyme, but they had word meanings that that ended with the same theme, and in the original, uh, that's what this does. Uh, so it. it it's a, it, it is a prayer, but it's a song, uh, and it's also a song. And um, it's basically her uh, prophetic prayer. Also, what this does is it puts uh, her not only as a story figure in Scripture uh, that we've just read about in 1 Samuel chapter 1, but it puts her words uh, in the text in these, first, in these next 10 verses. So we know that because her words are here in the text that these words are inspired. Uh, if they weren't inspired, they wouldn't be here in the Bible. So uh, this poem is important because it's not just Hannah's prayer it's God's. God is inspiring her uh, to, to say this. So this is God's word. All scripture is inspired of God. It's God breathed. All of it, including this. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice on your salvation. So in her very first stanza of, of her prayer, I mean, look back at her life. She's saying that she's exalted and she rejoices. And, and you know, look back at the previous sadness and despair because she was barren. But now in the, her very first stanza, and remember, this is a woman who has weaned her only child and given this child up into the service of the Lord forever. So this is very, very, very powerful. Very powerful. I smile at my enemies. Remember the woman that tortured her year after year after year, Penina? She smiles at her enemies. Now, why can she smile at her enemies? Because the most powerful thing that can ever, and the most valuable thing, that a man or woman could ever have in this world that is more powerful than any rich, more powerful than any position of power, more powerful than anything that we will ever imagine is the salvation of our Lord. That, that, there's nothing more valuable than our salvation. Who, who here would trade their salvation for gold or riches? No one. We understand that. That's what she's saying, because I rejoice in your salvation. So all that other stuff, beans, doesn't mean squat, I'm not complaining about it. Your salvation, 
I rejoice in. Man, that, that's really a wonderful prayer that we should all attain or should want to pray. We should all want to begin our prayers with, with that kind of thanksgiving. That if there's nothing else, I, 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 can, be, I can have a miserable job, I can live in a miserable house, I can have a miserable spouse, I can live in a miserable country, but none of that means anything because I have your salvation. That's something that's really, really powerful. I think sometimes we rejoice about the wrong things. There's, no, there's none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. You know, metaphorically a rock, steadiness, consistent, reliable. That, that's, that's what that means, you know, rock. And, you know, this is a woman that, ha that did have a husband that loved her, that gave her a double portion, that really cared for her. She, and she knew that her husband loved her. But still, the rock was, her, was, was the Lord of salvation. That's who she talks about as, as her rock. That's who solved her problem. That's who she went to. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. So the, the words of and the taunts of Paniah are just useless boasts to her now. The bows of mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, which is complete biblical numerology there. And she who has many children has become feeble. See, she understood because of what God did for her that God can change things in a hurry. You know, God can make the feeble strong and the strong feeble. He can make the barren plentiful and he can make the plentiful, a woman who's bountiful, he can make her feeble. So, so at, at the end of the day, and, uh, God is still in, in charge. God is still in control of this thing. It's not, our, it's not our outside circumstances. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he brings up. The Lord makes poor and he makes rich. He brings low and he lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. You know, the poor and the downtrodden and the people who've been unjusted, you know, well, have always had God's favor, always will have God's favor. Those are always going to be the people that God is going to protect first. And that's iterated all through scripture. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. See, God owns this thing. The, the, the pillars, the earth, he built it, he owns it, he's in control. No man, no country, nobody will prevail. The only thing that's going to last is the word of God. It's the only thing that's going to be, be here in the end is his kingdom. For the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord shall judge the end of the earth. He will give strength to his king, and he will exalt the horn of his, of his anointed. And so we know that the child stayed there with Eli, and he anointed them. And we know later on that, that she had, what, three sons and two daughters. So the, the, the Lord continued to bless Hannah. Now, instead of, we got just a few more minutes so instead of closing up, what I'll do is I'll open it up to anybody else who has any comments. Uh, you've been hearing me bluster for the past 40 minutes, so if anybody else has any comments.
Right, he supported his wife. And, and, and the beauty was he supported his wife in her faith. That, that, that was the beauty of that man. You're right, that's a great point. Uh, yes, anybody else? Yes, Jack. Oh. Right. I mean, again, it's it's something for everybody, and it was important enough for God to include this in Scripture. So you know, she's one of the the, the few women that we find in the Bible whose words are actually whose prayer, whose words are actually in Scripture. So, you know, we know that, you know, she was inspired like, like the other uh, men of the Bible. We don't know who wrote the book of Samuel. We know that Samuel wrote a book, uh, chapter 10 and verse 25. Uh, uh, but, the, but the author of this book is anonymous. Samuel had died before we even get to chapter 25. Uh, his life uh, was already over, so we know that he didn't write the book. Nathan the prophet is considered maybe one of the writers of... Uh, we don't know, but we do know that, you know, Hannah's inspiration is here. And, that, and, that's, and that's what makes uh, that text even more uh, uh, intriguing. Thank you, Jack. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we now know the background and the birth of the last judge and the first prophet. That's pretty important. That's why it's here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, again, next week, Brother Bill Sisk will be here, and we will be likewise uh, engrossed in the, word of, uh, in the Word of God.